Hello, everyone, and welcome to the MEF webinar of uh, this week. Uh, we are live. It's the end of August, the 31st, uh, and it's great to have you talk about one of the topics which is closer to our heart. It has been for a long time. Um, I'm not here alone. Uh, I, I've got the pleasure of getting some uh, illustrious guests as well. But uh, before that, I, I probably just need to remind you very briefly who we are collectively. MEF is a mobile ecosystem forum, a trade association, potentially more than that, a place to think. And we bring together our 200 plus members and others to discuss topics that are central to the development of mobile and by now the digital world we all live in. I did say you won't just hear from me today. We are going to have Barbara Lamb, Barbara, the co-founder and director of Inside Angels, uh, a face that has been with us for multiple times and multiple of our uh, consumer trust surveys. So welcome back, Barbara. Um, somebody else you would have seen many, many times is Michael Becker. Uh, Michael Becker is a, a director here at MEF, uh, is the advisor for the Personal Data and Identity Working Group, the chair of our group as well. So welcome again to Michael. And also you would have seen before Craig Toll. Craig is from Assured, is a product management executive at Assured, looking at a multiple mobile and increasingly interesting topics. One of those is uh, one of the things it does for us is uh, sponsoring for the last five years uh, this uh, uh, study. This is the ninth uh, year uh, of our consumer trust study looking at the industry of personal data and security in this industry. So I will gonna start with you. Um, all of you will speak shortly, but first, Craig, um, I think we, should almost have a cake here with the five candles to to go off. Of. Well, thank <laughs> supporting MEF uh, for the last five years in this, which is a very important and big endeavor for us. Um, but let me ask you why? Why is Assurant interested in this area? Why are you looking at this insight? Yeah, so um, maybe I'll start to, to answer that just to give a quick overview of assurance and, and it'll kind of lead nicely into, you know, why why we do this and why it's important to us. But, um, you know, just just real quick background, you know, assurance is uh, um, a B2B to C business. So um, typically most people haven't heard of us or a lot of people haven't heard of us, but we are, you know, very large U.S. publicly traded Fortune 500 global company that has more than 15,000 employees um, across across the globe. And so we participate in, in um, you know, different countries, all, again, all across the globe. And um, overall, our, you know, our, what we focus on and what we, um, pr our primary purpose is, is protecting the major purchases that people have in their lives, whether that's their home, their just things like that. Um, and, um, you know, essentially that supports what our vision is as a, as a company, which is to be the leading global business services company supporting the advancement of the connected world. Um, and so in, in, in support of that, um, in the, and because of the role that we play in the B2B2C environment, it's really critical that we have um, uh, consumer insights uh, that support our our vision and and how we operate and how we deliver. So we're very much a consumer insights driven company, um, and it's necessary again in in the role that we play. We actually have a dedicated global research team um, that uses both proprietary uh, and secondary research to uncover those insights uh, into the consumer uh, in in the electronics technology protection industries. Um, so we we again look at pri primary research, um, syndicated research. Um, but we really do focus a lot on that, um, driving that and the insights that come out of that, um, that research drives our product development process and our, even our corporate investment um, focus uh, that, we, that we do. So, um, you know, I think that, <clears throat> um, that, that background supports that, um, you know, how important this type of thing is for us and the consumer insights and, and how it drives our company, you know, broadly. Um, you know, we, we work very collaboratively with our partners, um, but we, you know, our goal is to try to solve real problems for the consumers 
uh, in that role. And so, uh, and so understanding the consumer and what those pain points are is critical. And that's how you, you know, consumer insight research is, is how you get that sort of, sort of activity um, out of that. So, um, you know, the primary um, leading into, uh, you know, why do we partner with you? It's really in that same vein. Um, this is another area for us that is, you know, uh, very interesting in terms of protecting um, consumers, not only their technology, but protecting the individuals themselves as they navigate their digital lives. And, and so what we get out of this study is, um, you know, amazing insights and the longitudinal view we get here is really incredible as well. Um, you know, over the over the several years that this has been done, um, but it drives uh, strategic planning in our product roadmaps and prioritization, um, the marketing messages, the, pos the positioning that we use in selling and and, uh, our products and things like that, all are driven by those consumer insights. And especially this study in particular, um, you know, we'll, there's some products that we have in our portfolio and I'll touch on probably a little bit later on um, that I think are relevant um, to this that we leverage this insights for. And so, you know, that that's why we are behind this, support it, uh, you know, um, enthusiastically and believe in the mission that, you know, that the MEF is on to support this. And, and Craig, let me inter introduce a little bit too. So as a, as a protection company, you were talking about helping people protect the, you know, their major purchases, like I lose my phone, um, you know, it needs to get replaced, those kinds of things. But it's not just about the hardware; it's about also protecting their data. No, and right. absolutely, absolutely, yeah. No, um, there, you know, and that comes to the, the the data is a critical component of that, um, um, especially as you think about the connected connected devices and the amount of data that is being generated now um, as people navigate their you know their digital lives across these connected devices. And so that's why it's so important for us, um, like specifically in this area. Again, that you know we're protecting the individual, protecting their data, protecting them as they as they navigate their digital life. Um, you know, a couple, you know, maybe just another quick segue on, on you know uh, supporting the notion of the research, how, you know, how focused we are on consumer insights and research. We've been doing our own um, sort of longitudinal study as well over the last several years since 2016 that we call the Connected Decade, and we do it across six countries: um, the U.S., U.K., Germany. Japan, Austria, Australia, and Brazil. Um, and a lot of it, you know, as, as the title suggests, Connected Decade is focused on connected technology, but some of the insights that come out of that are very specifically, you know, targeted to uh, around data and the fact that, you know, consumers as they use these techno uh, connected devices are very concerned about yeah. their privacy and security of their data. In fact, 80, in the last study we did, um, uh, the most recent one, 86% of consumers are concerned about that. Um, and it's one of the biggest um, items that, uh, you know, prohibit or, uh, uh, you know, cause friction in adoption of connected uh, technology because of that fear. Um, and so, you know, that's very, very much a focus of ours to help, you know, help assuage those fears and help them navigate their digital lives, you know, confidently and successfully without um, uh, losing their digital identity or, or having, having it compromised. Awesome. Wait, now, if uh, data and consumer insights is central to a Fortune 500 company, as important as Assurance, definitely is central to our life of math and so many of our members that are using the consumer survey. Now, probably it's time to, to, to welcome uh, not just Barbara uh, in her. Uh, in a role as uh, uh, the analyst, the analyst, but the consumer trust itself. Um, Barbara, can you tell us something? Maybe we can start from announcing the title, what has been, and why you do that when you bring up the slides, I just remind to everybody that is listening right now live or uh, later uh, recorded, but uh, this uh, is available on uh, um, for download. If you're not a member, you still get an executive summary. There is a full uh, report and the full data available if you're a MEF member. But here we are, the ninth annual trust study, and here's a big uh, suspense control for, uh, through data abstinence. May I ask uh, Michael and uh, Barbara, what do you mean by that? Barbara, go um, for it. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so, this is the emerging theme um, coming out of this year's study 
Um, and we're going to be spending some time walking through six key headlines with the supporting data that will help to explain that consumer trend. Um, but it's it's essentially the fact that trust in data sharing is 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 quite weak, and therefore consumers are responding in a particular way. Um, they believe they have control, but they don't necessarily exert true control. Um, so we can come on to um, walk through the, the key data points that that support that. Would you like me to give a bit of an overview of the study first? Well, yeah, and Barbara, and also too, can you emphasize as well how this study has been evolving over the years? So, for example, when we first started, you know, uh, it was initially about trust and just real high level elements of privacy. And then around 2016, we started interjecting additional evolutionary questions as people started adopting more of this. So if you can talk a little bit about that, that'd be great. That's right. Um, so I've been involved in this study for a few years now, and we've been seeing a bit of an awakening over time and a gradual progression of people's attitudes resulting in certain types of behaviors that have just sort of become more marked as things have gone on. Um, the study now includes some really useful data points around data harm, for example, um, as a way of understanding what are the influences on consumers um, that are causing these evolution in uh, attitudes and, and behaviours. So it's a really rich study. Um, there is some longitudinal data there, and um, it gives us quite a sophisticated understanding of, of this domain. Perfect. And maybe jump into some of the next steps. Uh, one thing that I wanted to point out, and I know it's already the methodology that you'll tell us about, but there is some big news this year uh, for the uh, report, which is we added three countries to the 10 we traditionally have, uh, which is, a um, you know, so welcome to Italy, Mexico, and Canada. We do cover now the G7, but we also add an additional layer uh, to Latin America with Mexico. So we, we, we're getting more into some of those emerging markets as well. So uh, back to you now. Okay, uh, I think I need to have control over the slide. Michael, you should please. have it. Let me do it again here. Hang on. You should be able to take control. If not, I'll drive at least the first slide again. I think we're we're cross pollinating each other here, so go for it. Uh, there we go. I can. And what you do that? Just to mention that our so our sample is BC has grown to eight thousand four hundred and fifty, which is a nice round numbers. And let's just show how how much work goes in collecting those uh, smartphone users across all of these countries. That's right. And the full report and data is available, I believe, on the MEF website uh, to, to members, uh, as well as an exact summary to everybody. So, um, yeah, the um, as we said at the top, this year's emerging theme is control through data abstinence. So I'll walk through the key headlines that support that and the supporting data, and we'll pause after each headline um, and allow the panel to reflect um, on that. So the first headline is that overall, trust in data sharing is quite weak. Many consumers simply don't have confidence that their data is going to be respected and that they will have and be able to maintain the good control over it. Um, it is worth just spending a moment on our definition of trust in this context. We look at three components here which are first, awareness of how personal data may be used, second, perceived level of control over data after it's shared, and third, the safeguards that consumers believe are in place to keep data out of malevolent hands. Um, and the key thing to note with this measure is that we are gauging people's perception, which in many cases will not be built on perfect knowledge, but it's really relevant um, because how people feel is is obviously what guides their behaviour. So uh, we do need to understand it. So to assess overall trust, we've constructed an index score based on the proportion who agree with or who have confidence in those three components I mentioned, awareness, control and safeguards. The index is currently 54 percent. 
which symbolizes that trust is weak for around half of global users. There is some variation by market, which is available in the full report. Um, but as a highlight from that, the index is strongest in Mexico and South Africa and weakest in Japan and Germany. And generally of those three components, people are a little more likely to say they're aware of how data may be used than they are to believe there are adequate controls or safeguards. They, ha they have adequate control um, or safeguards. And uh, we think that awareness is probably the result of both positive and negative forces. So the positive education, yes, but also it could be from scare stories or, or their own bad um, experiences. Um, so that's our first headline, just that overall trust in data sharing is weak. I think that over the last few years, we've seen a heightening of concerns around um, people feeling comfortable sharing their information. Um, so I'll just pause there to uh, turn it over to the panel for some reflections. Well, my, my, uh, before the reflection is a question to you, Barbara, we tinkered with the um, definition itself, but do you have a sense of how things are moving overall year on year on the, on the level of trust? Um, things are moving in a a slightly negative direction um, in that people are becoming more aware and more concerned of what can happen. That doesn't mean to say that their usage of mobile apps and services is declining. It's not, as you'll see in a minute, but there's this ongoing tension that people have, and it's very likely that they're not engaging in mobile life as much as they would if they felt really confident about this area. Yeah, and my sentiment on this is is people are feeling a bit cynical, right? I don't have a choice. I have to use the device if I want to have a job, if I want to if I want to go to school, if I want to get somewhere from point A to B to C. So there's a sense of, um, well, if I'm going to live in this internet world, I have got to give away my data, and that's just the cost. Uh, and unfortunately, or fortunately, that's not tr that's not necessarily the case. And as we'll talk about later in the webinar, there is education and things that we as industry can do to address that. But at this point, based on um, research that I've been doing, uh, also for my doctorate in this field, is that people are just super cynical. They don't they're not they're not believing that it's possible that they can actually have control. Yeah, I, I was going to, you know, to touch on similar, you know, the, the negative trend of that and the impact that it has. And to, to Michael's point, certainly um, people don't, are still using technology because they feel they, you know, have no other choice, as he said. But how they use it and the behaviors that they exhibit as they use it is what's really impacted here. And I think we'll, you know, touch on that a little bit more as we go through, through the webinar uh, and in terms of how that comes to life. But that's a really important element because how they behave and how they um, use their devices and choose, you know, not to share, as the abstinence <laughs> indicates um, up front, um, really impacts the the um, businesses that uh, consumers are interacting with and and the relationship of those businesses to those consumers. Yeah, you know, and just to kind of re deep digger deeper into the term of trust too, the general idea is I trust that you will do what you say you're going to do and that you won't harm me. And then if you do harm me, you'll remunerate any pain that I've experienced. That's kind of what trust means. And so when we start thinking about the lack of trust, it's really coming down to that. People don't trust that companies aren't going to harm them or that will take care of them if in fact harm has occurred. And, and, and another thing that's really important to think about it and is that the way the legal system is set up in the in, in around the world, especially in the in the U.S. and Western worlds, is the only way to demonstrate harm is through financial loss. But yet, demonstrating financial loss through the, my my misses misuses of my personal data is near, from an individual is nearly impossible. And so that's where we can, that that's where I think the industry is really struggling with. How do we actually deal with this harm? How do we actually um, give people the tools to be able to uh, you know, protect themselves? So trust is about all, all, all about control and harm mitigation as well. Yeah, and I think the other thing that erodes that trust and, and impacts the, you know, the, the negative trend is you know, awareness is going up, but primarily because of negative 
um, publicity or negative events that people are, you know, um, very aware of data breaches that, you know, get announced on a regular basis um, and, you know, the impacts and harms that come out of that. And so a lot of that awareness is driven through, uh, again, through negative uh, information sharing versus positive uh, interactions or positive uh, information. Well, and on, the, and on that note, as, as Barbara so aptly put in the beginning, our behaviors are driven by our feelings. And the negative news that we're seeing is creating anxiety, which is then leading to that element of cynicism. Yeah. Whereas if we can empower people and give them the tools and give them positive feelings, we can move past the, you know, past the logger jam that we're in right now. It's a big message there from what I hear, because if we are in the data economy, and as Craig mentioned it, business is impacted if there is not data. Uh, so there is, and there is the emotional element long term. So I think everything might be looking quiet on the surface, but it sounds from what you're telling uh, us that underneath uh, the big currents are play, and you need to be knowing what's what's happening out there. Um, Barbara, maybe I'll give it back to you to see if you can take us to to the next uh, big finding. Okay, so. Our second headline is that we've been seeing data sharing concerns increasing in tandem with usage of mobile services increasing. So this this is all about the you know the tension that we're touching on here. Um, so um, there is um, here we see the top ten activities people have used their mobile for in the last six months, and you can see increases across the board since 2020. Um, so entertainment activities such as listening to music, social media and gaming are the most common, but actually some of the largest percentage increases are for transactional things such as ordering products and transferring money. Um, so it's quite possible that the type of personal data being shared may be more sensitive, may be more financially oriented. So um, you see that general increase across the board. Um, and users do tend to agree that mobile apps and services are very enticing in terms of being easy um, and convenient to use. However, um, what's also been happening is that data sharing concerns have heightened in exactly the same period. So it's a couple of really key stats here. Two thirds of users globally say they're concerned about the amount of information collected about them and the same proportion avoid sharing personal data when possible. And both those metrics have increased significantly, even from just one year ago, up five points, up four points. That's, that's a really important um, finding, the fact that that's increased statistically significantly um, on the very robust samples that, that we have. Um, so, so that's our second finding that we see that increasing usage, but increasing concern going in tandem with it, um, which sounds like it's quite consistent with with your earlier reflections. And when we think about the nature of data sharing, too, I think it's important to understand that um, I don't think really, and th there, there's a whole other round of research that we might be able to do, Dario, if we can uh, if we can get some underwriters to support us, and that. The, the level to which people understand really what is data sharing and what data are they sharing. And this idea between explicit data I'm sharing when I am filling out, say, a form on the web versus the implicit data that's being collected on me as I'm just navigating my, my digital life and, that, in fact, my digital life. And I think there is so much more, you know, think about that, that stereotypical tip of the iceberg what most people think about when they think about data sharing is they think about my government ID number, my email address, my phone number. What they don't realize is that, you know, they're actually sharing their real-time uh, uh, location history. They're sharing educational history and financial data and all of this other data that's being implicitly shared as they're interacting throughout their throughout their digital lives. Um, and I think this is really important. And, and again, I, if, if people were truly aware of what's going on, I think the trust levels would be impacted significantly as well as their behavior. So I think there's a lot more that we need to help people understand as they're, as they're thinking about what does it mean to share data? 
Yeah, I, I would uh, obviously agree with, with all that. The, uh, one other um, item of note, um, I mentioned the Connected Decade Study that, you know, we we also run um, in how technology, you know, connected devices beyond phones are used is, you know, similar to the to the last slide that um, Barbara had up there in terms of you, usage. Um, you know, it came out that uh, entertainment and durability are the top drivers of, of, you know, people buying smart technology. And then home security, energy efficiency, and, and automating tasks is, are also relevant, but, but but a lot less so. And the reason I share that is because that this issue of sharing data applies across not just phones, but into, you know, all connected technologies um, that people use. And, you know, we touched on uh, earlier that, you know, the impact of business, but this, this creates quite an interesting conundrum, if you will, about um, the relationship with consumers when two, two out of three of them avoid sharing that their personal data um, because of that fear of how it's going to be used. Um, and the conundrum being that, you know, um, meaningful data um, is critical for businesses to create those connections with consumers. And so if the if the consumers are withholding that data because they don't trust the businesses, the businesses don't get that data uh, in order to create those those you know relationships that can uh, power those relationships over time with the consumer. So it's like this you know circular circular thing that you know leads to the erosion of the relationship uh, between consumers and, and the businesses that they interact with. Well, and, and Craig, I think you've raised it a couple times. I think you raised a really important point. What is mobile today? But mobile is also our connected devices. It's not just this rectangular box I carry around in my pocket, right? It's my connected car. It's all of the things that I do to interact with myself mobile um, throughout my, my digital life, that digital and physical world that I experience. So mobile is much more than just the phone. It's, it's all of our connected devices within our lives and the data that flows throughout those. And then even those devices that aren't necessarily having a SIM chip in them and aren't necessarily technically mobile, they're still internet enabled, and that internet enable uh, enabledness, if you will, uh, is often controlled by mobile. So I'll control my IoT devices throughout my throughout my throughout my um, through, throughout my mobile devices. And then let's not forget too, it's not just about filling out forms or downloading apps or interacting with things. Mobile is also becoming one of the centralized tools for managing our identity and how we verify and authenticate ourselves. And again, it's going back to really what is data. I don't necessarily know how much consumers really truly appreciate how much of their identity is made up by the attributes of all of this data that they're sharing. And so mobile is becoming instrumentally uh, significant in all aspects of, uh, of that digital life. So much so that the uh, as a little plug for our, our next event, um, the MEF is putting on both a fraud event coming up as well as an IoT event on uh, September 7th, where we'll be digging into some of these, you know, IoT, uh, mobile ethics related type issues as well. So there's just so much that uh, that is mixing into these just simple insights that we're seeing here. And, and listening to you, it sounds like we we have an issue both on the active data that people share. We don't want to overpass it when collected, but people simply don't don't like either of them. And yes. two big says. A slightly vicious cycle then is what happens if you if you starve the system again. I do like the, the, the uh, Michael branching out as a step because business has got implications of everything we do right now. The data economy is not just uh, the social networks anymore. Is how do you manage your car? It's your, it's your IoT system. It's your it's your house. It's your security. It's your alarm. Everything to do that. And, so, and mobile is the remote control that helps you manage all of that. It's at the center of all of it. So we, uh, we're talking about something that's pretty much uh, universal now and quite central. Um, Barbara, I might ask you to, to see if it what will be the next big takeaway from the report. So here we're starting to get into a little bit the solution space and the mechanisms there, there might be for alleviating those concerns we've been discussing. And, and um, really what we see here is that despite all the tools and services and education on offer, unfortunately, users still seem to lack knowledge about what they can do. And there's a bit of a lack of, uh, I would say, true engagement. Um, th there is some improved awareness of enterprises attempting to educate users 
and of the existence of options to keep data private. But as we've seen already, that doesn't seem to have helped all that much. So um, as you see here, over half of mobile users claim they've been hearing about more messages, education and options about how to keep their personal data secure. We, we're getting more, more of that um, over time. But um, when we directly ask what stops users taking action to protect their data and identity, we're still hearing the same story. And in fact, it's getting louder, uh, which is that they lack knowledge of tools and services that could help them. Um, that it's too expensive or it's too complicated. So fundamentally, it seems that um, they're not perceiving enough value, or that would be my interpretation. They're not perceiving enough value in these offerings and almost the perceived pain of changing, um, you know, moving towards a solution is greater than the uncertainty of, of main, just maintaining the, the, the status quo. Um, so there's there's an issue of engagement, an issue of um, true understanding and, and knowledge there, um, is my view based on this data. Let me jump in and say I've seen some positive, we have seen some positive, positive information about enterprises doing something, which is a, the consumer seems to be saying it is improving. So, okay, it's not all bad news, is it? Or is it, Michael? Is it all bad news? No, saying... it, it, it's obviously all not bad news, but I think the issue is one of, you know, we've got, we, we, so much of our lives have become, you know, you know, you know, Apple and Googleized in the sense, in the sense that the, the big tech firms are doing, doing a great job on essentially giving us all the easy button, you know, giving us, you know, you, you open up an Apple device, it works perfectly. You open up a new Google pixel, it, you know, it's all you know, seamlessly understood. You know, how do we remove the friction from all of those consumer engagements to guide someone as seamlessly possible through the customer journey? And to a certain extent, we've lulled people into complacency such that they don't want to take on any friction to be actually proactively um, protecting themselves, right? And so, the you know, as I said, I'm working on my doctoral studies in this area. And one of the areas, the thing is, is like, I'd like to do some, I'd like to do more to protect myself, but to the per, the first bullet, I don't know how. And then two, it's just too much work, right? I, you know, it's, it's, it, it costs too much. It's too much effort. You know, and that, and we'll often hear about this, uh, you know, academically, we'll hear about this concept of the privacy paradox, where people will tend to forego privacy and security for short term convenience, because they don't understand the long term implications of if my data is breached today, or taken from someone today, the harm that I might experience may not happen for years from now. And so the event of the harm, when the, when the actual harm occurred, when I lost my data, to when I actually feel the out the uh, the implications of that could be years later, and I think that's one of the challenges that people are struggling with is they just don't really understand how invaluable and how important their data is. To to Barbara's point, to to get over that hump, to feel that they actually should be doing something about it. Craig, are consumers lazy? Yeah. <laughs> Complicated. I don't know. Is that is that what it is? Are we all lazy? Yeah. A, 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 a little bit, but not, but not, not, not everyone, of course. But, um, but you know, I think there's, there's, I think there's two things at play here. And you know, Michael jump, uh, you know, beat me to the punch on one of them on pr the privacy paradox. I think that's certainly one of them. Um, the other is, is, is habits, right? And and um, and Barbara sort of touched on that a little bit, and you know, on the behavior element, but breaking a, a, a habit. Is one of the hardest things to do with with consumers, and so the, you know, the pain of what they are using currently or whatever experience they have currently has to be so bad that they are driven to make a change, or the solution that's being offered is so compelling to them that they're willing to make that change. So, I mean, those are really the only two ways you can break, you know, consumer consumer habits, and so I think there is an element of of laziness in there certainly, but also just that just changing habits is really hard. And, and actually to, to truly protect yourself um, in, in, the, in today's digital world, you do have to change your habits. Um, you, you need the tools, right? And there are more and more tools today uh, available than there were last year or the year before, right? And so there's still that lack of knowledge or awareness of these tools, but, 
but having the tool is one thing, but using the tool, most of them require you to make a change in how you behave and how you operate when you're navigating your digital life. And that's just a, a really, really hard thing to, to get people to change. Yeah, and so when we look at these tools, there's really two types of tools. There's active and passive tools. The passive tools are like, a, you know, once you've installed it, you know, any ransomware, any uh, antivirus software kind of works in the background for you. But an active tool like a password manager is a tool that you have to actively use. It's not going to do it for you unless you use it. Um, or a VPN. Yeah, you can have a VPN on your computer, but if you connect to, or your mobile phone, but if you connect to an open Wi-Fi network and don't turn the VPN on, it doesn't do you any good. And so it's that kind of behavioral change that people need to understand and learn and that the context of it, if I connect to an open Wi-Fi, the very next thing I have to do is turn on my VPN. Um, and again, it's those kind of behavioral steps that people just, you know, it takes a while to learn them. And there's so much friction in the process with all everything else that's going on in our lives. You know, again, Google just makes it so easy. You know, get a free Gmail account, start doing what you need to do. Uh, and adding any additional friction into that um, it, it can be a real challenge. Here we go. So, Barbara, what else have you got in store from us from, from these reports? We seem to be generating a lot of debate around here. Yeah? <laughs> well, this is good, but I agree with everything that's been said in terms of there's a huge amount of um, inertia going on. Um, just trying to progress the slide. I got it. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, the, the fourth point is is a quick one, but it's a really central one, um, which is about what consumers actually do do in the face of this concern and um, uncertainty. Um, and what they're doing is they're asserting a very imperfect form of control by abstaining from sharing data when they can in order to just reduce their exposure to to risk so um yeah we can we can go to the next slide um we asked users what allows them to feel in control of the data that they share and the answers reveal that this this whole concept of abstinence is is really central so they're very selective um about only using services they trust they only use the, the biggest reason for feeling in control is is only engaging with services that seem really trustworthy um but they also share as little as possible, second reason, and they um, say that they de delete inactive accounts. So it's much more about selectivity and abstinence than it is about those more proactive measures towards the right-hand side there. So the default option is to be skeptical and to engage less than you would naturally want to um, because of these types of concerns. That's the full headline. Yeah, and and on this note, I also like how do we how do we interpret who we trust or not? I think it's really difficult, right? When we see large Fortune 500 brands, we think we can trust because we assume regulations are out there protecting us. We assume the brands are doing the right things. As you get longer into the longer tail of the businesses, there's less understanding or less lens to, you know, who these companies are and what they're doing. So we'll often use brand as a proxy for trust. And we'll say, oh, I, I see that brand, so I trust it. Um, the the challenge with that, though, is I don't think uh, you know individuals really appreciate or understand like the tracking utilities that are happening behind behind the scenes, or you know what's what you know what's under the covers. So, yeah, you know, I think businesses going forward really need to you know take that extra stage and effort to think about transparency and really explain. Here's how I'm collecting your data. This is what I'm doing with it. This is how we manage it. And that whole life cycle uh, is really critically important to continue to build that trust. And, um, and Barbara, one thing you've noted here, um, and we've shown this in previous studies, is what people are also doing is that they get halfway through a transaction and they get any kind of icky feeling of, I'm not sure if I can trust this, they leave. And so you know, to uh, Dario's point earlier, Businesses are being impacted by loss of revenue because of this loss of lack of trust issue. Um, and, and it's a pretty big deal. 
Yeah, I, you know, I, I we've touched a lot on what this abstinence impact is, and, and you know what you just touched on as well, Michael, and what you said, Barbara. The, the one thing that the, the uh, one of the items in here that sort of caught me by surprise is that you know that one out of three say they pay attention to privacy policies, you know, T's and C's. I mean, I that. I don't know if that's really true. I mean, sometimes people say, I guess that, you know, one out of three people are saying it, I would have guessed at best one out of 10 or one out of 20 would even do that. I mean, I, I, myself, I, I, I'm not good about it either. I'm guilty as charged, but most people don't read those things and they don't understand what they're giving up when they agree to those terms and conditions. But, you know, for, for me personally, I feel confident doing because I know I have other tools that I'm using to protect myself. So I'm so less concerned about that individual uh, a set of T's and C's and, and privacy policies, but um, you know, understanding them is 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 great. But again, that's not necessarily going to protect you broadly, um, even if you did take the time to read those and understand what they uh, what they are doing. You know, in any specific uh, interaction and or engagement you have. But anyway, I thought that was kind of an interesting one that popped out to me that the the, the, the uh, a lot higher than I would have expected. People saying that they actually do do pay attention to that. Well, you raise a good point too, and and we'll get to this of why why adopting tools are so critically important is, you know, we often, you know, try to you know, as they say, we we try to close the barn door once the cow has actually left the barn, right? And the rea and the privacy policies and terms of service are all about forward intentions. What do we intend to do? How do we want to protect you? But if a company doesn't follow their own policies, or if they end up into a breach doesn't matter what the privacy policy or terms of service were your data is out there and now what do you do and i think that's one of the things that uh that people need to learn is yeah you can reduce what kind of data you share you can reduce what kind of businesses you interact with all of that's good but that doesn't negate the, in, the absolute critical importance of proactively using tools that protect you um you know uh, preemptively protect you from there being a problem versus uh, after the fact I think uh, I'm equally surprised, as Craig would say, that one in three of uh, people would check the TNCs. I don't. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm also linking to what Barbara was saying. Isn't this a very emotional discussion? The more we, we, we discuss it, it turns out, I suspect there's a bit of a um, guilty factor. Oh, yes, I better say that because it's the right thing that I should be saying. <laughs> I should be looking at the privacy policy and TNCs, and yet, as uh, uh, as Michael says so many times, says, "What are you going to do about it? Do you want the service? Is a yes or a no in the end?" Well, well and, and let's be clear too. I mean, lawyers are experts in write, you know, you know, writing language that makes you think one thing but actually means something else legally. And I'm not, and I'm not saying that it's it's necessarily uh, you know intended to be harmful. But it's, you know, the, you, know, there, you know, you have to remember the business's goal is to protect us from getting as much, you know, to protect us so that we can get as much data as possible to use it for the widest amount uh, of purposes. That's the business goal because, you know, personal data, identity data is, is a valuable asset. Whereas the person's goal is I don't want you using any of my data for any purpose. And so the 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 relationship between industry and the individual are actually on the opposite spectrums and that's the game we're playing with these language and these tools and these interactions is to try to find that middle ground um and so yeah i mean i i'm like you guys i don't read the t's and c's more than enough but even then when i try to frankly as edu edu educated as i am i don't understand you know, unless i spend an hour reading them over and over again to understand what the words really mean you know, I don't really understand it, but yet then you have certain instances like what happened um, earlier this uh, this or this month actually uh, with Zoom. When Zoom comes out and says, "Hey, we may or may not be, you know, listening to your calls to be able to train our AI," and then Zoom had to back off on that when people really realized what they were. Tr that's where that's a great example of where the words were misunderstood, and the people raised their hand and said, "Wait a minute, that's a problem." So. I think we're really in a really interesting uh, state as we evolve um, these behaviors. But the reality is, uh, and, and Barbara, you can talk about this. I think there are certain, from previous studies as well, I think people are deluding themselves a little bit. Previous trust studies uh, are deluding themselves a little bit and thinking that the actions that they're taking actually really matter. 
you know, like, you know, not sharing a data point or two is really not going to protect you. You need to do more than just that. Yeah, we actually ask what specific actions people are, are taking and, and the top ones are, are always around sort of settings, management, anything more um, comprehensive um, is, is much, much lower down. Um, so they, they, they are doing things, but whether it's a complete solution is, is doubtful, um, I think, from our data. Well, it's a good moderator and reminded us that we have we have to move to the next stop uh, topic <laughs> in our whistle tour of this report so barbara sorry two more Good. to go uh, not too bad so um it may not be a surprise to hear that social media and big tech which for some people merge together um in their minds are driving a lot of the concern here um, and we have a number of indicators to back this up uh, first of all, social media companies are the least trusted type of organization for looking after personal data, um, as you see here. So we asked users how much they trust different types of organizations with their data, and you get medical and financial institutions tending to come top, while government and social media tend to be at the bottom of the pile. And a third of users do not trust social media companies much or at all with their data. We also asked users how secure they felt different activities were on a scale from one to 10. And here we are looking at those who give the highest ratings, just eight and above for the different activities. And we see that social media sharing is the lowest result again, only felt to be secure by a quarter of mobile users. And it's also the only activity to decline in, in this measure, albeit only by, by a point, but it's the only one uh, to decline. And um, final indicator of, of this issue is that we also asked users to rank their top three regulation priorities. And in most markets, the number one priority is ensuring big tech companies don't have too much power over personal data. So there is an imbalance here. People are feeling like the power is, is somewhere else and, and not with them. So it's just yet another indicator for us. And there were others um, in the study that tech and social media are where a lot of the focus needs to be in order to improve consumer trust. That's the end of headline five. Yeah, and, and if you go back to the, if you go back to the previous slide, there's a comment I want to make. I think it's important. I think we often we look at this idea of security. One, it's a bit scary that people think on, on, only you know forty percent of banks are properly securing our our stuff. So that's you you would hope that that would be more. Um, but the other thing that we'd we'd want, uh, I think that yeah. is a eight to ten, giving eight to ten. Yeah, so okay. So we might give giving seven or six. I'm trying to defend the bank. Yeah, no, 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 no. That if accurate is possible. But I think the key point I wanted to make here was we often inflate to uh, conflate two concepts: privacy and security. And it's really important at this point to recognize that they're very, very different things. Security is about who can have who is authorized to have access to data or a system and what are they allowed to do with it so access and control Secure, security is about access um, and and control of data privacy is about the individual an individual's ability to assert the who what when where for what purpose and for how long someone could have access to them and so i think it's really and so you know it's really important, you know, and, so, and maybe in future studies we can ask too about the you know the privacy. You know how how good are companies do, uh, doing and at, at protecting your privacy versus how are they at securing your data? And those are two different th different things. Securing my data means are you keeping the bad actors away from getting access to my data? Privacy is about are you doing what I'm telling you to do with my data? Are you giving me the ability to assert control over my data? And I think uh, it, it, the latter we've learned is no, people don't think they're being given control of their data. That's where all the concerns are coming from. And on the security sides of things, um, that's more of a technical discussion. Yeah, and I also think it's interesting that, you know, the um, that social media is the um, you know lowest uh, in terms of trust, the lowest on perceived security, yet it's it's probably where the highest volume of activity occurs for people as they go online. Um, and so it, when you think about some of the other things we've already talked about, you know, if that is really the case, then, 
they're trying not to to share this data, but they're you know by the you know very nature of what a social media you know sort of site is, um, you are sharing data constantly, um, whether you think you are or, or, or not, and you know how that is used in many ways as has been touched on many times. You don't necessarily really understand. Um, and then the other, the other only other comment I make is that you know the convergence of you know social media and tech. I mean, there in many cases, like, you know, the, one of the largest social media companies on the planet, Meta, is also a very large tech company. And so, you know, they you, you're you're playing in both realms um, uh, uh, when you interact with companies like this. And and you know, the fact that they are the you know the highest in terms of where their concerns and fears are is is you know quite interesting. Well, and, and, and one final point before we move to the last slide is, again, helping people understand what, in fact, data is. Data is just not the stuff I fill out in forms. Data is all of the data, the digital exhaust that my behavior um, uh, creates. And so one example of data, too, and I was just talking to a cybersecurity researcher the other day, and he's like, do you realize that we'll often, when we're analyzing people's interactions with our app, we will look at the gyroscope on the phone. And if the phone's laying flat, we know it. If the phone's like this, we know it. So that will that will determine for us the difference we have, is that phone sitting in somebody's hands, possibly used by a human, and is it moving around a little bit, or is it sitting flat on a shelf? And if it's sitting flat on a shelf, it's probably a cyber scammer that's got a bank of phones mimicking that human behavior. So the idea of the orientation of the phone is also data you're producing that I don't think the vast majority of people would ever consider. Well, for all of you looking the world upside down, you know, you, you've been watched as well. <laughs> um, I also will uh, probably, i like to highlight that again, the this nature of a study, social media, when we, five years ago, we probably started, tracing some of these was not particularly badly seen by the by the view of the, the the audience out there that has been a trajectory and it has it has taken quite some time and that could also be happening to some other of the categories out there if you're not actively protecting your profile or how you use data etc so i think there's a bit of a lesson in there it didn't happen like that took a long time. It was actually a very lagged response from the user, I would say, in terms of after the, the big scandals that we've seen in the past. So well, that goes back to the, the point that Craig made earlier. You know, either I have to be severely harmed to change my behavior, or I need to see such a massive opportunity to do so. And even then, it takes time. You then have to actually then proactively go through a period of time to build the habit to adopt that new behavior, but it, you know, and then I think um, Barbara called it inertia, which and actually you know, good. The changing emotional perspective, they're not changing the some some are, but people are still relatively using their social media as well. They're not giving up. Well, they, and let's call it. I mean, it's very difficult not to, right? You know, it, it, that goes back to earlier. You know, I was talking to an FCC lawyer years ago, and. They were saying, well, you know, if you don't agree to the terms of service of that, you know, we were talking about LinkedIn in that context. Uh, if you don't agree to the terms of service, then don't sign up for the service. And my point to her is like, that doesn't make any sense because in today's world, I can't have a job without a curated LinkedIn profile. So you're essentially saying to have me exit myself out of uh, of digital society or society in general, if I'm not, a, if I if I don't want to participate in this digital ecosystem, and that does not make sense. And so that for me, and so that's really, I think, one of the challenges that regulators and technology providers really need to contend with is, you know, how do we, in fact, truly give people the control and uh, that they, they so need and in, in, to be able to successfully participate in this world? Barbara, you're going to take us to the next chapter of our uh, analysis, but while you do that, quick reminder, if you happen to have questions, you better send them to us now, as we seem to have limited time. If not, I'm sure we'll find ways to, to reply by email. But uh, back to the uh, chapter six. Chapter Barbara. six, yeah. And it's the final headline, which is, I know of interest to assurance, which is that there are re there's really only muted interest in new um, comprehensive solutions, such as personal information, management systems 
So um, we presented users with a concept statement here on the left to describe a service where you could view all the data held about you by any organization and then very easily withdraw it if you wish to. We thought it sounded great as a concept, but the response was fairly uh, lukewarm, I'd say. You, you get two thirds who say, yeah, it's interesting, I'll have a look at it. But roughly the same proportion also say they would only use it if it were free. And they think that organizations should be looking after their data anyway without them needing to have to be involved in this kind of way. So although it's interesting, there's not enough information there to see the true value of such a service, at least from this description, um, which I, I think just sets out the challenge for us in terms of how can we convey broader benefits? How can we dramatize other things such as the convenience of it um, to make these kinds of solutions uh, more, more compelling and engaging to, to people? Um, so yeah, another, another opportunity to use the word um, inertia. <laughs> yeah, and, and, my, and my point on this is, and again, as I said, I've doing a lot of other side research on this on this very topic, and the reality is people don't understand it yet. They don't know what the power of it is. They don't appreciate the value of their data. And there's a general sense, too, is, well, because they have it, they being all the companies out in the world, the, ca the, the, the cat's out of the bag, the cows left the barn, there's nothing I can do. And I don't think what people are appreciating is just because they have it doesn't mean you can't have it as well. And if you have it, then there are so many things that you can do with your life to generate insights around your data and such. And Craig and I have been bouncing back on this now for years. Uh, and I think there's kind of three phases that we'll see an evolution as PIM services are now to start being brought in the market. The first phase, which I think we're still very uh, squarely in, is the protection stage. Let me protect myself. VPNs, password managers, antivirus software, you know, let me circle the wagons, collect my data, get it into one place and have it be protected. Once I've done that, we'll move into an insights stage. What can I learn if I have control over my data? And then the third stage is the monetization phase what, or a value with valorization phase. How, how, how can I uh, reap value from the data of my data that I have control over? Uh, and today it's really about protection and like identity management is where the industry is at now. And we're going to see two more phases of the evolution of these concepts as people start learning how to get value from their data or how to gain insights from their data and then ultimately valorize it. And, and again, Craig, you've been building a tool in this space. What are your thoughts around that? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I think the, you know, the headline, you know, saying muted interest is, 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 is the right way to phrase it, right? Because because there is interest, right? Two out of three people say that they would be interested in it. Two out of three people say that they would check the data. But then when you go to action, right there, it, 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 you know, that's when the the numbers change dramatically. And it's because of what you know Michael just highlighted is um, they don't understand or um, the value proposition for them doing so isn't clearly articulated. Uh, in order for them to take action uh, and, and do that, but you know, PIMs like solutions have been around for. For many years, you know, in various forms, and so if we want people to um, uh, use tools like this, then education on you know the value proposition is critical um, to make that happen. Uh, and you know, as Michael just alluded to, and I mentioned up front, we have been working on a product in this space for for, for several years. Um, uh, the product is called Pocky Privacy. Um, that's our brand, sort of B2, B2B brand, as I mentioned earlier, we're B2B to C, so it can be white labeled and that kind of thing. But it's really a, a, a whole uh, protection um, product that allows consumers to protect their digital identity as they navigate their, uh, their, their, their digital lives with unique credentials with each and every account that they create, unique password, unique email address um, to anonymize themselves in that, in that way. Um, includes the, and, and collect their data. And well, I was yeah, I was going to go there and try to blocking trackers to protect themselves as they navigate as well. And then the last piece being, you know, squarely in this sort of PIMS arena of collecting their data, and it allows them to all of the data that a consumer leaves behind as they navigate their digital lives is collected. So you know exactly as a, as a user of a, the solution what data you left with who, even what day and what time you left it with them, um, and so you have clear. Uh, visibility uh, of that data, so you know who has what. And, and to Michael's point, that there is an evolution of the usage of that 
um, over time. And I think he, you know, framed it really well with the three phases that he talked about. But you know, this is a product that we've been really excited about and think it has uh, the potential to bring a lot of value to the marketplace. But again, the education and selling that value proposition and getting consumers to engage and use um, is the hurdle that has to be uh, overtaken in order for this to get any sort of market traction. And I, and I think at this point, Craig, it, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that the biggest, that, so what is a PIMS? You know, at the, some level, it's a personal data store. It's, it's a it's a database of all of my personal data that I can have control over. And then on top of that are services. And the key is to make sure those services have some utility. And I think that's where people are struggling. So the utility of a password manager, the utility of me being able to, you know, present a verify, present a claim of my identity and have that verified in a secure and privacy preserving way. I think we need to go through that process and really as an industry, understand what utilities do people need to re reduce, reduce friction in their lives. And, and Barbara, you said this all the way in the beginning. It's about convenience. It's about efficiency. It's about that sense of, uh, 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 of security, that peace of mind, I think, is what we need to be building into these utilities that are sitting on top of these data stores. Efficiency, I've heard, and convenience, well, convenience, I think we have two minutes to show how good we are, <laughs> summarize all that report, uh, and the lessons for the industry. Uh, so, Barbara, you might start very, very fast. What are the big lessons that we'll ask Mike and Chris? Yeah, I'll, I'll just pick out the key, the key messages, really, which is about, let's not be complacent here, even though mobile usage of of different apps and services is increasing. People are not engaging fully in, in mobile life because of the concerns they have. Um, as a result of that, any systems that we might build that um, rely on data to, to perform well um, are at risk of underperforming. Um, so there's a real challenge in terms of the industry doing a better job of dramatizing the benefits beyond addressing risk and going beyond and looking at things like convenience and and efficiency so i think those are sort of the biggest um takeaways in terms of industry lessons yeah, I, I think this 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 i mean this is this uh is a you know a fascinating area that is only continuing uh, to be more and more important in our in you know our lives today as is all uh, the, the proliferation of connected devices and digital uh, lives that people lead, you know, that this becomes so, so important and, and relevant for. Um, so I think the, you know, what we've learned this study and year over year and participating in, in this with the MEF is, you know, really been a, an amazing journey to see and very valuable to understand how that consumer sentiment is changing over time. And so, um, um, you know, I know we're, we're up on, up on time, but just the, but just to, to close, I you know I talked about the pri privacy product that we offer. I also mentioned our connected study decade, that, our connected decade study that we do. If anybody's interested in either one of those and talking to them about them, please feel reach out. Uh, feel free to reach out directly. Happy to talk to engage with anybody on that. Yeah, and the final points that I'll raise is you know as the uh, you know uh, advisor to PMF uh, on the PD and I working group. I mean, please get involved with our working group. Uh, you know, be aware of the up and coming events. Uh, as I said earlier. Uh, also be aware that we are now that this study is done. We're now going into the next study, the 10th annual study. So if you have any interest in being involved in help, helping shape the 10th annual study, that will be released next May or June, but we're starting now. Uh, please get involved with that. And on that last point of the PIMS and last point I want to emphasize is it's going to take some time. I mean, Craig's been kind of beating me on this for years and that like, dude, it's, it's going to take a little longer than you think, but it's going to take us some time. But as people adopt more of these tools, as people become more aware and gain control of their data, businesses are going to start to have to learn how to do P uh, business on people's terms of service to access them. So it's going to move from me agreeing to your terms of service to you're agreeing to my terms of access. Um, the other thing that we need to think about and be very well aware is the internet is becoming increasingly age aware. And age is going to be controlled through tools like Pocket Geek Privacy where I go to a website, I'm not going to give you my real birth date. I'm going to share with you a digitalized token, for instance, that says, yes, I'm over 21, or 
Yeah, and so we're going to see a, new, a whole new layer of granular control of data exchange coming from new tools like AKA PIMS, like AKA digital wallets. And digital wallets are the blanket regulatory model that's going to be in place across all of Europe um, come the end of 2023, early into 2024. So uh, again, these insights, these studies, these evolutions that we've been talking about are, are critically important. So lots of things are happening. Stay tuned. I would say it seems to be the message. This is the beginning. Definitely. We're not at the end of something here. But with that excitement, <clears throat> a big thank you. I I look at the, at the watch on my right, and I think it's time maybe to say thank you and uh, <clears throat> potentially see you later. As Michael say, we're already working about the 10th uh, report. So more of this is coming. So to Barbara Langer from Inside Lange. Angels, thank you to Craig Paul from Assurance. A big thank you again. So is for Michael Becker uh, from F. Uh, from my side, uh, thank you for being online to watch us or during one of our recording. Do send us back your feedback. As always, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for staying with Math. Thank Thanks. Bye.